Hey everybody and welcome to Healthy Living. My guest today is none other than one of my favorite people in the whole world, Dr. Doug Lyle. Dr. Lyle is the psychologist at both the True North Health Center and the McDougal Living Program, both located in Santa Rosa, California. He is the co-author of this amazing book called The Pleasure Trap. He is the founder of the website esteemdynamics.org and much to my surprise, he's had a podcast for a year, he never told me, but he is doing this wonderful podcast called Beat Your Genes. It's an evolutionary psychology podcast that airs on iTunes and Blog Talk Radio. You can listen to it live every Wednesday night from 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Pacific time. And you can even call in and ask questions. And thanks so much for being here, Dr. Lyle. You're my favorite person to talk to, I think. I learned uh -huh. so much from you. Great pleasure. Right. Great pleasure. So I've interviewed you before, but why am I interviewing you again? Because I'm going to be seeing you very soon in Vegas. And if you want to see Dr. Lyle live, consider coming to the Live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference in Vegas. And I know we're going to talk about some of these things. But for whatever reason, you've had this podcast for a year, and it kind of slipped under the radar for me and a lot of people. And then I find out about it on June 18th, and I literally listened to all 73 episodes in about 18 days. And the reason I wanted to interview you is because I I saw a different or I heard a different side of you because I'm used to seeing you. You're like the opposite of Dr. Goldhammer. You know, you're this very kind of kind and gentle, n not, not that you're mean on the podcast, but I think of you as just very pleasant. And I another side of you came out in the podcast. It was a little bit edgier, perhaps and a little bit more direct. And the reason I wanted to talk to you is because there are things that I've heard you say and the wonderful lectures that you've given at the McDougal program and at True North and that are available for free on your website, esteemdynamics.org, and that I've seen you give at conferences that I watch over and over to learn these principles. And every now and then you'd throw out a line where it would just sort of land it in my memory, but I really wasn't sure exactly what you meant. We, it never got talked about in detail, but in the podcast it does. And so I've written up, I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but I've written out a list of things that sort of intersected, things that you've touched on in your lectures to the more general health community that I think people should know. And again, I really encourage you to listen to these podcasts. You are making my exercise life so easy because when I listen to your podcast, a hundred minutes goes by, I'm still on the bike and the class ended you know, 40 minutes ago. So good for you for that. So one of the things, let's just get started, is I once heard you say in one of the talks you gave at one of the McDougal Advanced Study Weekends that weight is the number one predictor of self-esteem in a female. And you said that, and it, there were other things in the lecture, and it just sort of kind of stayed in my memory bank. And as I started running the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I noticed that it seemed to be right what you said, that it almost seemed like there was an inverse correlation, it, almost the more overweight a woman was, it almost seemed like the lower her self-esteem was. And one of the reasons I want to do this is not to make people feel bad for being overweight or having low self-esteem. I want people to be empowered, especially women. Right before we got on this, this interview, I was interviewed by a physician for her podcast and said, why do you do what you do? Because it drives me crazy when women are not empowered. I want to them to feel empowered. But in your podcast, you went into this from a little bit different angle and more in detail that there really is a cost for being overweight in our society, especially for a female. And I'm not talking about what the medical doctors say about heart disease and diabetes and all-cause mortality. We're talking about a cost emotionally, in the workforce, in romantic relationships, and especially for a female as she's maturing. And it what well, made me sad because I believe that it's true because I grew up the fat girl with brothers that told me the guys don't date fat girls. And it, it turned out that at least in the 60s and 70s, they were right. I didn't get asked to my prom. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I, please, you, you, oh, one of the things you said that blew me away is, and again, this is not about shaming people. This is about empowering them, is that you said that behind closed doors, your male clients will say things to you like, I am not sexually attracted to my wife because she's overweight. And again, I don't want to make people feel bad. I'm doing this because I want them to solve this problem and feel good. But but what you're saying is like it was mind blowing. It's it, because nobody's talking about this because it's so important to be politically correct that people, I want them to know that there is a cost and, and, and that there is something they can do about it, of course. So take it away. Well, there is a cost, and, and everybody uh, that deals with the weight issue is dealing with that cost. 
And everybody's situation is different. So the personalities are different and their personal circumstances are different. So there are certainly women that are very overweight that have very high self-esteem. Um, they're extremely confident. They're competent. They get a lot of good feedback from the world. So we wouldn't want to paint everybody with the same brush. Uh, there are thin, beautiful people whose self-esteem are in tatters uh, because they've got unrealistic expectations for their life and they, they have a lot of problems and they've got natural emotional instability. So when we, when we make a comment uh, like self-esteem is the, uh, or weight is the number one predictor of women's self-esteem, uh, we're making that on a statistical basis, looking at a broad population in some survey. And certainly it is obvious when we look at our country, if you go into any bookstore on Amazon uh, or you look at any magazines, you're going to find that all over the magazine covers are weight, 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 weight. In other words, the whole entire country is obsessed with weight issues. And the reason why that's true, uh, that, that didn't happen by accident. Uh, it happened because here in the last 50 years, this population has become very overweight. And uh, as a result of that, there's been striking losses uh, at the individual level in their own lives, in, in individuals' lives as a result of this. And so therefore, they, are, they feel that psychological pain. They are aware of where it's coming from. And they seek assistance. So they seek it on the front of Good Housekeeping magazine. They seek it in Cosmopolitan. They seek it uh, at, at their doctor's office. They seek it at every weight loss, you know, snake oil medicine, you know, purveyor. And they seek it with us. And so uh, we we are trying to guide people along a pathway. You and I and John McDougall and Alan Goldhammer and Neil Barnard, Colin Campbell and Caldwell Assassin and. Dean Ornish and Joel Furman and the whole gang, okay? We're, we're all trying to point people in a way to lose excess weight in the healthiest fashion possible. And uh, so we're trying to help them uh, do this in the healthiest way that we can, we can guide them. But along the way, we know that what's motivating them is rarely health concerns, sometimes. And oftentimes they have ancillary health concerns, so we will hear that. But the thing that we hear most is the self-esteem crying out for relief. Uh, the person feels very internally critical. A lot of our people are very conscientious, or they wouldn't be with us. They'd be doing some other smoke and mirrors um, solution. Uh, they tend to be intelligent. They tend to be conscientious. And they tend to have a lot of standards for themselves. Uh, for their behavior that are pretty high because they're usually very confident people in their own workplace and in their own lives or their home with their kids. Uh, so their expectations for their own ability to manage a problem are pretty high. And this problem um, is so slippery and such a remarkably deceptive trap that, um, that they frequently fail. They frequently struggle a great deal. And so whether it's our people or it's people in the broad public, People are scrambling for an answer to this problem. They are rarely finding it. And as a result, uh, they continue to pay the emotional prices that you see are motivating the national obsession with this problem. Well, that makes sense. What do you think some of the emotional prices that they pay are? And, and why does it seem that women seem to pay higher prices than men? Yes, I believe women uh, probably do pay higher prices than men. I'm not sure that that's true, but uh, I would be very surprised if it, if it were not true. Um, the reason why that would be true is that excess weight impacts your appearance. Uh, it makes you less desirable. It makes people want to be close to you and touch you less. Uh, people are less sexually attracted to you. People find you to be essentially, uh, if we looked at, uh, at very detailed analysis, we're, we're going to probably find that people find you less trustworthy and less intelligent, which is completely ridiculous, but it is nevertheless uh, inferences that, that I believe people are making. And uh, you might call it fatism. In other words, there's a there's a uh, almost a natural uh, bias against people that are overweight uh, for, you know, along many dimensions of personality uh, that are not true. 
uh, but, but are nevertheless inferences that I believe that people make. And as a result of that, um, they're, oh, I believe women pay the price higher. And I believe they pay it higher because in the case of attractiveness, uh, sexual attractiveness, it turns out that what makes people appealing uh, is significantly their physical presentation. It's not everything. In other words, people are very interested in another person's mind. They're interested in their personality, their intelligence, their background, their culture. Certainly, the inner beauty of a person is very important in a romantic process. But the external, what we look like, is very important. And it's going to turn out that um, it's going to turn out that it is it is uh, the issue of uh, excess fat will be a bigger penalty to women than it is to men, all things being equal. So I think that men are probably as overweight in this country as women are. Um, I believe that statistically it's probably pretty similar. They're all eating about the same foods, so, so I believe that's the case. However, when it comes to the aesthetic price that people pay, women pay a greater price, uh, I believe, because of uh, uh, part of the problem in the animal kingdom for males is to try to figure out whether females are pregnant. And so uh, uh, males tend to not be interested in females throughout the animal kingdom when they are pregnant. And the only time in our natural history when women were substantially overweight and they had their waistlines were much larger than their hips uh, was when they were pregnant. And so it, it is undoubtedly the case uh, that men are inferring that women are pregnant when they are substantially overweight, and therefore this uh, hugely impacts the woman's sex appeal. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't men that are not attracted to overweight women, and it doesn't mean that there aren't men that aren't very attracted to their overweight wives. Um, I will just say that if we were to run a careful survey and we were to determine um, whether or not excess weight on a fit male or excess weight on a female was paying a larger price for their aesthetic appeal, I believe that it is overwhelmingly the case that women pay this price much greater than men, and therefore women have a much greater obsession with this problem and a great deal more pressure. So that's, that's why I think that is. I believe you said that because there were no overweight people in the Stone Age, that the only possible way for somebody to be overweight would be either if they were pregnant or maybe taking more than their fair share, which is why some of these inferences occurred. Because there are people that have judgments that, oh, well, if you're overweight, you're lazy, and, and that's absolutely not true. But that in the Stone Age, if somebody was considerably overweight, they were taken more from the collective, right? Uh, Did, didn't you say yeah. that once? I, I did say that, and I, I believe that that's probably true. Yeah. In other words, I, I can't believe that in the Stone Age, when we did a lot of food sharing, that there wasn't scrutiny on people's waistlines, and that there wasn't um, there wasn't some essentially social sensitivity to the fact that if food was limited and one person was carrying an extra twenty pounds, that that others were not inferring that that person wasn't getting more than their fair share. Now, whether or not that's true or not, it's kind of irrelevant. I believe that those inferences would have been made, and I believe that those inferences linger uh, in the subconscious of modern humans. I think that I think that we make that inference, and in it's I don't think it's an unreasonable inference. I don't think it's true, but it's not an unreasonable inference, and it's one that comes quite naturally. Okay. I read things that overweight people are discriminated against in the workplace and that they don't necessarily make as much pay. I mean, I mean, so I, I want to try to empower people that there's other reasons to lose weight other than just your cardiovascular health, that, that it will improve many areas of your life, like your self-esteem. So more people are overweight than not now, you know, so will it become just that this is how we are and, and that we neuro adapt to overweight people. So now everyone will think they're more attractive or is, or is our Stone Age brain just still going to say, nope, look better? Yeah. Our Stone Age brain will not change. In other words, our Stone Age brain is going to carry the same aesthetic ideals that go back 100,000 years. Yeah. So if you go back and you look at statues of Venus uh, made in Rome or Athena in, in Greece 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 
you will find that those measurements are 36, 24, 36, 5 foot 4. Okay, so uh, I've been there, I've seen those statues, and so the aesthetic ideal for humanity is embedded into the genetic code. Uh, that's what it is. So it's not going to change. I do believe that people that are overweight today, uh, there is so much company, there are so many people that are 40 or 50 pounds overweight, that the price that you pay generally socially is not as high as it would have been 50 years ago. Hmm. 50 years ago, you would have been sticking out like a sore thumb. Today, right. you're just kind of along with the pack. But what it doesn't, uh, so socially, the impact is much less. Sexually and romantically, I don't believe the impact is less. In other words, I, I believe these very same aesthetic circuits of sexual appeal uh, are going to remain as a relative constant. And I think that, the, in other words, I believe that the entire culture is paying a, a major price in general uh, and much great, uh, reduced life satisfaction in that arena uh, uh, behind that reason. Uh, I think there may be reasons why things are better in some ways. I think people have more access to more partners and with the internet they can, they can find people that can fit with them better in many ways. So I, I think that you know, I don't think it's just all bad news in the modern environment, but I think that the the main effect or the main problem that is faced today, uh, that is the main feature of human self-esteem suffering, is going to be, in the Western world, it's going to be excess weight on both males and females, but predominantly the price being paid heavier by females and how it is that they feel about themselves, and it influences a multitude of their relationships in the world uh, the primary one being where they stand with respect to romantic partnerships. Uh, it turns out that the research evidence is absolutely consistent with this interpretation. And in relationships uh, where, where it is believed by male and female that the male is more attractive than the female, the female feels tremendous pressure about her weight. Uh, in situations where the partner's uh, sense and have a tacit understanding that the female is more attractive than the male, then the female is not sensitive and anxious about her weight. So these are, are very interesting parts of the romantic interplay that take place between man and woman, and uh, they're, they're not going away no matter, it, no matter how uh, overweight the populace becomes. Wow. You, you had a caller on your uh, podcast that said, well, what do I do because I'm ugly? And you were very sensitive and kind and said, well, I'm not going to use that word. I'm going to say less attractive. And the advice you gave were to change the things you can change. I mean, we, you know, of course, there's without plastic surgery, there's certain features that we have, but our weight is one of the things we actually can change. And you talked about how important it was to get fit. And, and as hard as it is to to overcome weight loss obstacles, that is something that is changeable. You know, maybe our eye color and our, you know, we can't always change this, but, and that's why I, I, I know a lot of people are saying, well, I tried, it's hard, you know, are, are there, what else can women do then to feel empowered and raise their self-esteem if they've completely given up on this weight loss journey? I mean, how else do we raise our self-esteem? Well, you, your self-esteem is basically coming from a few different sources. So it's coming from feedback you get from males about your attractiveness mm -hmm. it, uh, or females if you happen to be so inclined. The, uh, it also has to do with feedback from friends about, about how much they value you as a person and it also in the workplace about whether people value what it is that you can contribute to society and the economic workplace. Also feedback that you get from children or family uh, about your value as a mom or friend or sister or daughter. Uh, and also from your internal audience, that is a feature of human psychology that, that makes us really unique. We essentially have a bunch of little people uh, sitting inside of our head that are sort of watching what it is that we do and how we do it. I knew they were there. My whole life, I knew there was people in there. Yeah. Strange little people. Uh, they're sort of family. They're sort of ourselves. They're sort of uh, the people out there in society watching us. Uh, they're not any specific individuals. What they are is they are a, 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 a statistical composite of the people that are kind of important to us. And it's just sort of a mythical set of people. Uh, when people say things like, I'm so disgusted with myself, what that is is that's the internal audience speaking to the self. Okay? You yourself are the one that's pulling the strings and actually you know, washing the car and going to work and 
going to the gym, that's yourself. Your internal audience is effectively not you. It's a, this mythical set of people that are watching this whole process and they're giving you a nice steady stream of feedback about how well they think you're doing. And when you, uh, so this winds up being an important component of what we're going to call your self-esteem. And so it isn't just feedback from the opposite sex. It isn't about our sex appeal. It isn't just feedback from friends. It isn't just feedback from the workplace. And it's not just feedback from family. It's also feedback from our internal audience. And so um, one of the most important things that we can do to raise our self-esteem is to do a fine job at living in front of the internal audience when nobody's watching. Okay, so uh, we're not going to be perfect. We've all got foibles and funny little things that we do. They're a little goofy. The internal audience doesn't care about that. The internal audience cares about how well are you preparing to contribute to relationships with other people. Are you taking care of your body? Are you taking care of your finances? Are you doing a good job with respect to your friendships? Are you taking care of family? In other words, uh, you know your, your home, your car, your hair, all about you. Your internal audience is watching your efforts. Uh, it doesn't demand that you work feverishly to put your best foot forward every second. It, it demands that you do a good job. And if you don't do a good job, it gives you feedback that it's a little disgusted with you. And so it turns out that when we struggle with the pleasure trap and eat a lot of unhealthy food, the internal audience is chirping away. It is basically saying, I'm kind of disgusted. You know better. I, you're, I'm kind of disgusted. You are causing us to be in a body that isn't feeling, you know, and we're not going to have a good romantic uh, experience in this life as a result of this. You are costing us to fe effectively painting finger, a finger at the self. And it's shaming the self, so people will feel guilty. Uh, that's the self responding to the feedback from the internal audience. Uh, the internal audience's expectations are usually reasonably high. In other words, it's not easy to just say, oh, well, just forget it. Who cares? Yeah. The internal audience is aware that, that you live your life in a competitive matrix, that you must compete for mates, you have to compete for friends, and you have to compete in trade. And so the internal audience is aware of your efforts as you go about the business of attempting to be competitive. And, uh, and if you are doing a mediocre job at preparing to be competitive, then it gives you feedback. And it says, you're screwing up. You're doing a lousy job, and I'm kind of disgusted with you. That disgust self-feedback um, is not... In, in cognitive therapy, for as much good as cognitive therapy sometimes can do, cognitive therapy misinterprets this feedback quite often. They uh, misinterpret is they call this internal audience, they call it the internal critic. So they have arrived at a very similar theory to where it is that I sit. Uh, slightly different. There's a difference between an audience and a critic. Uh, the, the, the audience... The critic in the true sense of the word critic, of which there's neither positive or negative, I would agree. Okay, So you could call it the internal critic, but that's not what they're saying in, in therapy. They're saying that you have an internally critical voice that is chirping at you and kind of making your life miserable, and you need to talk back to the internal critic. Uh, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of the internal critic. The internal critic is not a critic. It's an internal audience that is sometimes critical. Mm. Yeah. It's critical, it is critical for a reason. And that reason is, is that this is a evolutionary engineered signal to tell you that you are dropping the ball. You are being either lazy or you are being uh, having a lack of courage. You are trapped by some set of motivational forces that are overwhelming you into not putting forth an excellent effort. And if you do not, for whatever reasons, put forth an excellent, excellent effort, your internal audience will be critical of you, okay? That is fair. They are trying, actually, to help you because fundamentally they are on your team. Uh, they're like a coach. They're a coach that's telling you, hey, there's a problem with your form, okay? or there's a problem with the, way, with the way you're practicing. And the fastest way to change the internal character of how it is that we feel about ourselves is not to talk back to the internal critic. The fastest way is to do a better job. Okay, if we do a better job, even even within minutes, 
we can start to watch the internal audience start to, to shift its tone a little bit. Uh, by the time you put in a diligent hour, your internal audience can feel somewhat better. Uh, it may still be pretty critical. It may not trust you. It may not feel like you're going to continue doing a good job. But if you do, if you do a good job for several days in a row, if you do a good job for a couple of weeks in a row, the internal audience will definitely change its tone to a very positive set of feedback. And that will be the stream of, of internal feedback that will be hitting your self-esteem mechanism. You will feel much better about yourself, even though nobody else has noticed any improvement. So that, and that's what I'm after for people. I want them to, to seek the immediate and authentic relief of doing a much better job uh, at, at, at the, those kinds of effortful processes because their internal audience will absolutely give them good feedback. So are people that are perfectionists, do they have a more critical internal audience? Because there are some people that, that seem to, even yes. when, when they're doing what I would think is a great job, they're like, oh, no. So is it possible right. that our internal audiences vary as far as how critical they are? No question. Okay. And so the, um, that is true. Your internal audience kind of takes on some of your personality characteristics uh, because it's kind of you. Wow. So, uh, so that is true. So if you happen to be naturally extremely conscientious, uh, then you're going to have very high standards and your internal audience will demand uh, very high standards out of you. And so that's just sort of too bad. Uh, that means that you can get that same feeling of self-esteem that anybody else can get, except that you're probably going to have to do a better job than most people do. Wow. wow. It's just how it works. That's where some of our extraordinarily high achieving people come from is when you get that kind of an internal audience wedded with some talent in some ways, uh, those people will not rest easily. They don't sit in front of the TV and just goof off easily. Uh, they don't just skip their workout easily and they don't just say, we're going to order takeout greasy food easily. In other words, those sorts of people, the internal audience demands uh, very high attention to detail and, and excellent execution. And, that, and if you don't do it, the little guilt chip comes out as the internal audience is a little bit disgusted. Wow. So you really can't change how conscientious you are, but you can certainly change the behaviors that you're doing. That yes. Are. So when people fall into what you call the ego trap, is that because their internal audience is just really disgusted with them? Or is it the other way around? No, actually what's happening here is the following. That your, yourself... Um, I give the example many times, so let's look at this process. That um, yourself, which is the person who's actually doing the acting in your life, yourself believes that it's capable of certain things. And let's suppose that it's um, that that you you expect that you could be an, a well above average student. So you're a sixth or seventh grade student, and you work very hard. And it turns out that you get straight A's, but it was hard for you to get those straight A's. And you had a couple of teachers in hard classes that were really nice, and they really liked you, and they gave a lot of A's, and they gave you an A. And now, unfortunately for you, you've got a mother or a father who tells the world that you got these straight A's, and that you're brilliant, and that you're a straight A student. When the truth of the matter is, throughout the rest of grade school, You've been an above average student, but you haven't been a straight A student. You know you're no genius and you don't have any magic dust. And quite frankly, in your class, in, in your science class, you were probably the, the 13th best student out of 30, but you had a very lenient teacher that laid an A on you uh, nonetheless. So now you've got a mother who is essentially saying that if you just apply yourself, you're very brilliant and you're going to be a straight A student. And so now what we have is that the external audience uh, starts to be, you believe that they are informed, uh, your uncles and your cousins and your brother and your sister and your father and everybody else under the sun, is now thinking behind this PR that you're really, really smart and that you can be expected to get straight A's. Now you go into the next year and those teachers are gone. And it's sort of back to the normal landscape. And you know that if you work really hard, you're probably going to get four A's and two B's. So you are aware 
that you are unlikely to live up to those expectations. Now, it's going to turn out that there's an adaptive move here that's very tragic, but it's, a, it's adaptive. So this got selected in human evolution as a, as a behavioral option to be considered. And that is that a behavioral option to be considered is to not try at all and to make it exceedingly clear to those that believe highly in us and highly of us that we are not trying. So now the move is to get C's and B's or C's and B's and a D and to make it exceedingly clear to our mother and anybody else who's watching that we are clearly not trying. And so we have to make it crystal clear. So that way we hold on to that fancy esteem that they believe that we are really brilliant. Okay, so this is the only way to do it. We know that if we do our best and wind up with four A's and two B's, that we are going to lose that cachet. So in order to protect that cachet, we actually sabotage our current efforts. This is what I call the ego trap. The ego, or the self-esteem mechanism, is trying to optimize how much esteem it gets from the village. And one of the ways it can optimize that esteem is that when we have been given too much esteem, the right thing to do is to sabotage it, to sabotage our efforts. So this is a, I believe that this is a very key heart of the addictive process. Uh, people that are competent humans that are addicted are aware that people close to them believe that they can just put down the bottle. And so what they do instead is they make it exceedingly clear to the audience that they are not trying to put down the bottle and that they are procrastinating on this until next month, next year, after the big thing, after the daughter's wedding, whatever it is. In other words, procrastination and excuse making is the is in fact the hallmark of somebody in the ego trap. Now, uh, the internal audience is watching this whole thing, and the internal audience is really not that privy to what's going on inside the self. So these are like segmented areas of the mind, in effect. And so the internal audience is aware of what other people think. So it essentially sets the bar as to what it thinks other people think that you could do. And so as a result, um, it sets, if it sets the bar too high, which it can, just in the case of these grades or um, somebody that is very highly conscientious, for example, that learns about us, could come to expect that others would believe that they could just set their fork down, eat really healthy foods, wrap the salad with their hands, go back to the Stone Age with your diet, lose 40 pounds and be done. Okay, so it's not an unreasonable inference and it's not an unreasonable inference that a highly conscientious individual uh, that their internal audience would believe that they should be able to just do this easily. However, what will happen is the self will make an effort, just like our little girl made an effort to get good grades, and they'll quickly find out that this is a slippery, difficult trap, that it's actually quite a bit harder than we thought, and we're having trouble. And so when that happens, the self starts figuring out that maybe I can get four A's and two B's, but I can't get straight A's. Essentially, I cannot, I'm not so sure I can do this program. And so I would, I could hear that in the voices of a thousand people that have been through the McDougal program and have been through the True North program. Quote, I'm not so, I'm afraid of going home. Well, they're afraid of going home because they're afraid that they're not going to be able to execute this behavior in their lives. And so the self is watching this and thinking, I'm not so sure I can do it. Meanwhile, the internal audience is saying, why not? We would expect you to be able to do this. That not that your intention? Haven't you just been educated? Don't you see that other people are doing it? Look at Heather McDougall. Look at Chef AJ. For goodness sakes, they've done it. You should be able to do it. What's the problem? Okay. So if you have a high expectation, particularly high conscientiousness uh, personality, that internal audience can set the bar pretty high for you. And when you start finding out that you can't meet those expectations, then you can deliberately and maliciously self-sabotage. Okay? And so this is what people will do. This could be the beginning of just kicking over the table and just saying, well, I don't care. I was under a lot of stress, and therefore I just ate a bunch of crap. Okay? This is, this is the excuse-making and procrastination uh, that... that it is again the track marks in the snow that lead back to the to the ego trap. So these these two are these two traps 
the pleasure trap because of its because of its tricky hyperactivation of the pleasure pathways, which will draw any animal into its into its web. That gets in humans and uniquely into humans. It winds up throwing a particularly tricky curveball to a human being who actually sets their sights at trying to change behavior and may may wind up with uh, exogenous and an internal also pressure about setting the bar so high that they can't reach it and then they therefore sabotage themselves uh, by making clear that they're not trying. Those two things together are an unbelievable pair of snakes that wind around each other and make this the extraordinarily difficult journey that you and I find it to be. Right. You know, it was interesting because I didn't understand self-sabotage until I talked to you. Uh, one of your clients wanted to live with me for eight days because they had gained a considerable amount of weight and they wanted to change their environment. And we've talked ad nauseum about how we both believe the environment is the number one predictor of one's success on this journey. And I said to her, I said, so if you get a flat tire, do you then slash the other three metaphorically? She goes, yes. And then I break the windshield and I smash the car. And I, I didn't, until talking to you, I didn't understand that that was an example of the ego trap. Right. And I guess the next question is, is then how do we get out of it? Because one of the things I also learned from you is that the ego trap and the pleasure trap, they're kind of at odds. And, yes. and if I understand what you were trying to teach me correctly to help our mutual client, is it the easiest way probably to get out of the ego trap? And if you're, you know, binging every day at McDonald's instead of eating whole natural food would be to do like go to True North and fast or do an austere program like the ultimate weight loss program. But then if, if you're eating an F diet and the ego trap, that might be the bar set too high. So right. maybe you could do a little bit better, but sometimes doing a little bit better introduces some of those pleasure trap foods like sugar and flour and high fat plant foods that make it kind of hard. To, it, it almost seems like it's impossible, but like, it, yes. I mean, for some people, that's why I prefer to maintain an A plus diet because yes. I don't want to be in any trap, ego trap, pleasure trap. And I find it's just easier to, to, to do what Dr. Goldhammer told me to do than to have to suffer the way I see people suffering. So how do we navigate this, these, the pleasure trap and ego trap being at odds? And how do we get out of, I think we know how to get out of the pleasure trap. Right. But how do we get out of the ego trap while trying right. to escape the pleasure trap, I guess, would be the better question. Great question. And this is where uh, the individual individual differences come into play and they wind up being tricky. Okay, So every person that I talk to, I'm setting the bar at a little bit of a di different place. I need to know what their history is. I need to ask them you know, where they stand now, what they're trying to accomplish. And then what they've done and where they failed and what their successes have looked like and et cetera, what they're, what they're prepared to do. And so we, you know, I, I might set the bar at doing things 80% right. I think that's about as low as we can go and get enough out of the pleasure trap that we can get some traction. In other words, people that have said, hey, how about if I eat healthy during the week and then on the weekends I do what I want? That's going to be a problem, and the, the problem is, is that by indulging the, the taste sensors that much over two straight days, we're essentially not going to maintain enough sensitivity that uh, we're going to be trying to climb our way out of the pleasure trap come Monday morning, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be probably too hard, and then so pretty soon the person is just so habituated to the richer diet that they're just eating it all the time. So I, I think it's going to be very unlikely that people are going to be able to have a, 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 a standard that low and then wind up be successful. I could be wrong. Nobody in the world knows because nobody's ever studied this. But we certainly have an analogous sort of a situation, say, with cigarettes. Um, it's not so easy for people to limit their cigarettes to a pack a week. It's pretty hard. Okay, So uh, if you're using them that often, it's hard to limit it to three cigarettes a day. Now, there's people that have done it, uh, and there's people that can do it, but it's difficult. Usually, if you're eating, you're doing three a day, pretty soon you're doing five, pretty soon you're doing seven, and then pretty soon you're doing a pack. So it's pretty hard to tease the system uh, at, at, a, at, at some level. 
Now you might say, well, then what about your 80 percent? And this is what I introduce in in the slow, fast way starts targets lecture that I give at the McDougal program. The uh, it's online the McDougal webinar series. The uh, the reason why is that usually 80 percent is a significant improvement over where they've been, and it allows for a period of stumbling a little bit without throwing over the whole thing and saying, I can't do it. And the truth is, is that processed foods, rich foods, is not heroin. And it's actually not as impactful as cigarettes of uh, somebody that's the same withdrawal. It's, it's somewhere, uh, heroin or morphine, et cetera, is way over at one end, unbelievably addictive, very difficult to stand up to those cravings. Um, cigarettes are in the middle. Okay, they're they are not. Uh, they're probably not as tough, for example, as alcohol is to an alcoholic. Uh, but they're pretty tough. Pretty tough. It, it, they they trap a lot of people. But if you notice historically in this country, that when it became uh, illegal to smoke indoors, that our use of cigarettes went from about 50 percent of the population to 18. So a whole lot of people put away their cigarettes just because it was too much trouble to go outside. So that tells us that it is not nearly as impactful as heroin. So whenever I've read these things, like the Surgeon General says that cigarettes are as addictive as cocaine or something, it's like, really? I, I don't know what data you're referring to and on what dimensions of a, of a scale, but I know that as a real-life clinician staring at real-life people, that's ridiculous, um, I, that, that there's no comparison. They say the same thing about sugar, though. I've heard speakers at the McDougal Advanced Study Weekend doctors saying that, that sugar is as addictive as cocaine is her and heroin. There's no way that's true. Okay? So the, these, are, these are the ratings of people that are looking at one aspect of a study, and they're not looking at 14 aspects of a study. And so the, uh, or, or 14 different aspects that could be measured. So I know that uh, the people that, that come to the center for example, and do a water fast or go to the McDougal program and start eating healthier without a bunch of sugar and fat, do not go through the, the degree of withdrawal cravings that take place when people get off cigarettes. Mm -hmm. There's just no way. It's not even close. So uh, what this is is a very mild drug-like effect. Now, here's the problem. It's just mild enough to keep you in the trap. <laughs> okay, just because it's mild doesn't mean it's not a trap. And it doesn't mean it's not a tenacious little trap, because it is a tenacious little trap. So cigarettes also are just tough enough for you to get out of that they could keep people in it for a lifetime. So it's like, boy, all it would take is a couple of weeks of diligence and you could shoot your way through the straps and then you wouldn't be addicted to cigarettes. But it's just addictive enough. You know, this is not heroin. People aren't clutching their stomachs. They're not having hallucinations about bugs crawling all over them. This is, doesn't even remotely resemble the trap that an opiate gets you into. But it's 10% of an opiate, which is enough to keep most people trapped. And the same thing is true of rich foods. So rich foods is just enough to keep you trapped. Okay, so this is, uh, so individual differences here are important because some people, if you can, uh, these are matters of degree, but if you can do a substantially good job, but not a perfect job, you can move the taste preference systems to some degree out of the, out of the pleasure trap and you can be on your way, and you can do this and feel like the bar is not so impossibly high that you just throw your hands up when you make a mistake. Okay, so that's why I try to set it there. You need to set the bar high enough that the system sees that the internal audience watches you struggle and that you're having to fight for it, okay? and that you have to make some choices that you don't want to make. And it knows that you can do it, and it's watching you do it. When you do that, it's bolstering your self-esteem. And I want people to be aware that that's true. That in fact, the number one thing I'm after when I'm after the pleasure trap is actually the internal audience. I'm actually after self-esteem. I want people to understand that their self-esteem is what I call dynamic, which means it can change. Um, traditional psychology sees self-esteem as a fairly intractable shaping that takes place as a result of parent-child dynamics early in life. And that it's a very steady sort of thing that only changes like a glacier. The, uh, the truth of the matter is self-esteem is dynamic. And it seems steady because people's behavior and their efforts tend to be fairly steady. And so 
the, the, the feedback from the internal audience tends to be similar from month to month and day to day. But if it is, you've got a steady stream of negative feedback, self-disgust coming from the internal audience to your self-esteem mechanism, that is not you. That is what you are earning. Okay? And it turns out that what I want people to learn is that they can set the bar at a reasonably high level, short of perfection, and dig for it. If they do that on a consistent basis, I want them watching for the change in their self-esteem like a hawk like a scientist looking for a particular creature under a microscope, under a whole mass of other creatures, an expert watching for that little funny red thing with the little wiggly thing on the end, because that's the thing we're interested in. I want people to be looking inside their own psychology, watching for the self-esteem mechanism to rise. And I want to have them see that, that they didn't have to be perfect to get it, but they had to be good. Okay? Now, is Alan right? And are you right that if you do everything perfectly, you get out of the pleasure trap most easily, and you get the fastest way to where it is that you need to get to? Yes, you are accurate. I love hearing that I'm right. <laughs> However, if we set that bar for everyone, a great many people will will find pretty quickly that they don't they can't do it. Right. Uh, but if they're not ready, they're not motivated enough, their environment wasn't ready enough, they're not right. terrified enough, they don't have enough belief that it's going to work. They've got all kinds of reasons why that they may equivocate. And my attitude is, we're not looking for perfect. I just need you to be a B student, okay? I need you to be a B student for a while, and then we'll worry about being an A student later. And can it be sometimes harder to be a B student because the pleasure trap keeps luring you in a little bit? Yep, it can be harder in some ways. It can also be easier because we don't have this tendency to just say, forget the whole thing then, and kick over the table and just crash the whole car. Right. That's the, that is the yin and yang of a, of a problem that is uh, amazing. It, it, we are confronted with things in the modern world that we think, oh, these just must be timeless dilemmas of human nature and it's just conflict. Yeah, there's always been conflict in the world and we can read Buddhist philosophy and find out that there's always been troubling you know, personal dilemmas. This is not one of them that is supposed to be. We are not supposed to be living in a land with super rich, super normal food that is self-destructive, and yet it tastes like it's the most life-enhancing food that there is. That is not supposed to be a dilemma that human beings are supposed to face. So if people are struggling with this, which they are, by the hundreds of millions, if people are struggling with this, and even despite their best efforts, they are they are stumbling quite a bit. I'm hardly surprised. Mm -hmm. This is no indictment of their character. It's no indictment of their intelligence. It's no indictment of their motivation. It's it's an indictment of how tricky this problem really is, and why we need you know a thousand more people just like you, but we don't have them. Uh, and that and that why the kind of support that you provide uh, is an invaluable you know ancillary process to what it is that we can do with some of these more in-depth immersions. Well, we had discussed earlier that there are people that have maybe more critical internal audiences. So maybe there are some people, and it would be helpful to figure out if you're one of them, maybe like me, that's sort of an all or nothing black and white person that will do better having the bar as high as possible and staying there and other people, at least to know what kind of person you are. Because one of the things you said in regards to the client that came to live here for eight days was that because this was a very highly intelligent, highly conscientious person that did great in her job, that there was an inference that you're so smart and you're conscientious, therefore you shouldn't be fat. And that's that's not true because just because you're able to solve certain problems in life doesn't mean that you can easily solve this one, especially since we weren't dissolve, designed to solve it. Yes. You, you hit the nail right on the head. And so the particularly, I believe, intelligent, conscientious people um, are, even though they are more likely to solve this problem than anybody else, they are more likely to be surprised at their own struggles more than anybody else. So people that are kind of low conscientious, flakier individuals, they might hear about this, they might even be mildly interested, and they eat one potato and they say, forget it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. Yep. They, they don't. They don't have an expectation 
that they would take on something uh, this this tricky and this difficult. Uh, more conscientious people will. They believe that they should. They have a very um, high expectation internal audience. It's expecting them to execute on the information that they're learning. And then it turns out they run headfirst into a pleasure trap that is way tougher than they think. Pleasure trap is not a 90 mile an hour fastball coming out of a pitching machine that you can learn how to hit. The pleasure trap is a curveball that comes you know, from different directions with spin on it that we can't see. It, it's at your sister's birthday and she says, oh fine, would you like a, like a bite of this? You're hungry. You haven't eaten before you came because you didn't, you didn't really prepare for this. And there you are right there in front of a greasy cheese blends. Nobody you know other than your sister even knows that you're a fanatic. And maybe she doesn't even know to the extent of it. And so nobody's there, nobody's watching other than your internal audience. And the self gets weak and it can't stand up to the, to the pressure and it caves and now it's in trouble. Okay, and now it might be in a lot of trouble. So this is, um, uh, it, it, it actually, if it's, if it's not too deep in the ego trap, it's only in mild trouble. Okay, you're only in mild trouble. You can dig your way out with, with a, a day or two of, of healthy living. You're not, you did not dig yourself a deep trap. But if you're in an ego trap and you saw this as a catastrophic failure, then this could be the start of completely all the wheels coming off your, right. your, your car. And we see that, you know, we see that with people where they've done really well for a long period of time and they relapse, slip, fall off the wagon, whatever you want to call it, and then that's it. And, and yeah. to me, that's like so devastating because they I feel so bad for them because they've worked so hard. And you've said before that, that it really can take as little as three days to, to get out of this. Sure. Of just doing better, which is why I don't understand why people, when they fail at my program, go to a more restrictive program like a weighing and measuring. Because what I'm understanding for you is when you're in the ego trap, you just need to show your internal audience that you can do a little bit better. If you're eating an F, you need to eat a D and a C. If it's too, if something is too hard, you want to make it easier, not harder, I would imagine. Yeah, I think that probably what's happening is, is that people are failing to a whole new social situation. Uh, where the expectations are starting from scratch, and they're sort of starting over at a new school. Oh, I see. Uh, I see. You know, it's like if you, if you peed your pants in the second grade and everybody knew about it, you 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 can't you you it is music to your ears to find out that your parents are moving across town, <laughs> and uh, you're going to be at a whole different school next year. That's and I, I think there's a little aspect of that is probably what you're inevitably going to find. That, that may makes sense. Maybe, maybe if they if they haven't succeeded or failed, whatever words they want to use, they feel ashamed. Yeah. And th you you know, it's amazing. You're not an evolutionary psychologist. You're a revolutionary psychologist, and people don't even know that. Like they have access to you. You put aside a few appointments each week for regular people like us. If they want to talk to you, just go to esteemdynamics.org. Unbelievable. So I know that you don't. It's not that you don't believe it, but maybe you don't believe it the same way that others do in emotional eating and food addiction. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm understanding you correctly, what many people think of as food addiction, you think of more as like a more mild drug-like effect that people have to certain processed foods. That it's not right. addictive the way the cocaine heroin is, but it's addictive enough to make it that it's not easy to stop. That there yes. there is a little bit of something going on in our brains that make us kind of yeah. uncomfortable if we stop and not... Yes. Yeah. Um, emotional eating as a theory kind of comes from two very different uh, places. One of them um, has legitimacy and the other one does not. So the one that's legitimate is I'm really stressed out at work, didn't have time. You know, I'm just I'm just completely emotionally exhausted. And therefore, I did the lazy, easy thing. Okay, so that, that's going to happen to people. This, what we're trying to get people to do is it takes diligence, it takes energy into the system to stop what the default strategy of the system is. The default strategy of the system is drive through McDonald's. The default strategy of the system is eat the richest food in the environment that has the least possible effort involved in getting it. That's the default strategy of the nervous system of every animal. And so uh, we have that as the default strategy. So to combat 
the default strategy requires energy. It's the equivalent of an air conditioner for your house. It takes no energy at all to open up the windows, and then you get the same, you know, then the outside air you know, comes in. But if you want the inside of the house to be cooler than the sweltering outside of the house, if you want there to be a substantially differential, you want it 70 degrees inside when it's 102 outside, then it's going to require energy. You're going to have to put energy into the system in order to cool the air. That is required. The same thing is true here. That if you want the inside of your body to have healthy food in it, and all around your body is very, very unhealthy food, it's going to require energy to keep that gradient apart. Okay? And sometimes people in life, they have situations that come up often enough where that energy is compromised and then their diet is compromised. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that that can then send them on, on the tumble because it can put them into the ego trap because mm -hmm. now they've failed their internal audience. Or it can also put them into the pleasure trap because now we've teased the circuits. So that, to me, is emotional eating. Yeah. And so that, that is real and that uh, it's not a huge factor, by the way. People will think that it's a huge factor, but the research evidence indicates that it's a mild factor in, in this problem. Now, the other side of emotional eating that I will roll my eyeballs at, and I will, I think, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to save my big explanation for this for Las Vegas. Oh, and great! We video it, and then you can show everybody. And that is that um, the notion that we do these self-destructive things in the present because of emotional pains from the past. This is a very Freudian and neo-Freudian interpretation of human motivation uh, and personality. So this is, um, th this is essentially, in, in my view, uh, close to 98 plus percent bogus. You talk about yes. that in great detail in the, in, in the podcast because in the yes. lecture that you gave called Losing Weight Without Losing Your Mind that has, I think, like a half a million hits on YouTube that we recorded together five years ago, one of the things you say is people are not overweight because they have emotional problems. They're emo they have emotional problems because they're overweight. And right. I don't ever want to disagree with the most intelligent person I've ever met. But I'm reading a book on food addiction, and it says, among adult women who are addicts, 74% report sexual abuse, 52% report physical abuse, 72% re report emotional abuse. Among women who binge eat, 83% were abused as children. And it is linked to an actual study in the medical literature, which I'd be happy to provide for you. Sure. Yet in your podcast, you... And again, this is not, if you have had sexual, emotional, or physical abuse, again, I want people to know I'm not doing this to make you feel bad or wrong, because I've had two out of the three of those. But so many people say, well, the reason I'm fat is because X, Y, Z happened. And I think it's important, because again, this is really, we want to empower people, not shame them or make them feel bad, that, sure. that if they've had these things, they're horrible, and they need to deal with them, however people deal with trauma and abuse. But that's not why they're overweight today. Right. Yeah, this is a, um, uh, these sort of survey studies, post hoc survey studies are, are pretty close to scientifically worthless. Um, and any, any psychologist, scientifically oriented psychologist would recognize that that's true. You, you can't ask people uh, what they think the connections are between uh, their present circumstances and their past. They, they will report to you what they think is true. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, uh, this is the, the, there are similar problems throughout dynamic psychology. This is why, for example, the Rorschach test is a demonstrated fraud. Uh, and, yet, and yet thousands of my colleagues believe in it and mm -hmm. swear up and down to its validity. Uh, and that there's, uh, of course, great science that has completely checkmated many of these things. Uh, this a lot of this notion that early childhood issues uh, could, particularly traumatic issues of some kind, could bend a person to behave some way habitually in the future. This really goes back to Freud. It goes back to a man writing more than 100 years ago. Um, very brilliant guy and really a deep thinker, uh, trying to figure out the human mind. And he had. Uh, many, many limitations in his understanding of psychology and biology. And in particularly, I mean, 
I wouldn't say in particular, there were so many mistakes. Uh, but those mistakes, interestingly enough, remain cloaked to this day as pseudoscience in, in the field. And so one of those is, well, just to give an example, uh, Freud believed that, that people went through what's called psychosexual stages, where the little libido sexualized energy would, um, would go through stages where there was processes where they had to get through. And if you didn't sort of get through that process very well, then that would have a ding or a bias in your personality. So, for example, if you didn't get through the, the toilet training stage very well, uh, maybe you were overly controlled and upset because your parents were ashamed of the smell of your poop. And so you felt ashamed about it. So, therefore, you became an angel retentive personality. And you, had a hard, you would have a hard time pooping. You had a lot of uh, anxiety in your stomach. And you were also very neat and orderly because you wouldn't want things to be out of place or dirty. In other words, so he's trying to figure out why are there individual differences in people. And he's thinking maybe something very important in early childhood development in the process between parents and child would be causing these differences that we see in a 35-year-old. So another one would be the oral stage of development. So you're sucking on your mom's breast and put things in your mouth and Maybe you've got a problem in the weaning period, so you know maybe that makes you somebody that that never quote got satisfied orally. So that's why you're smoking cigarettes or smoking cigars or drinking alcohol or eat too much food. Okay, so you've got a fixation at the oral stage of development. You didn't get past that. Uh, maybe you've got a fixation at the genital stage, and so we've got psychosexual issues. Maybe you become homosexual because something didn't you know, didn't work out just right in your development. I mean, this is the way this guy's thinking. And so uh, for 100 years afterwards, people are respecting the awe and authority of psychodynamic thought. Uh, they're not respecting in, in academia, uh, not in scientific psychology, but out in clinical psychology, where people are talking to real life people as opposed to running scientific experiments and gathering data. Out there in the world, in the world of Time Magazine or anything else, that's who's talking, is the clinicians of theory. And as a result of that, uh, most clinicians are thinking some version of that, and that's a very common, like whatever book you're, you're reading from, that's, they have been infected by that notion. Uh, it turns out that that notion of personality development is 100% wrong. And this was proven wrong uh, in the 1980s by the experiments of monozygotic twins at the University of Minnesota, uh, where we found out that identical twins that were raised together were extremely similar to each other, and if they were raised apart by adoptive parents, they were extremely similar to each other. In fact, they were just as similar to each other. They right? were essentially almost exactly the same. And if you had fraternal twins, uh, a pair of boys that happen to be fraternal twins, or they only have 50% of their DNA the same instead of 100, and they were raised in the same family by the same parents. They aren't even remotely as similar as two people who are monozygotic twins raised apart by different people. Okay? So we start to find out that the genes, genetic variation, just as it makes an enormous difference in what you look like. So you can't tell me that Cindy Crawford became Cindy Crawford because she had really sweet parents that made her look sweet. You can't tell me that a Shaquille O'Neal became Shaquille O'Neal because he had parents that hung him upside down and encouraged him to grow to be seven foot two. Okay? This is not what happens, folks. The reason why it is that your body looks the way it looks in its general contours is because of genetic variation in the species. This is also why it's very clear that breeders of animals breed animals for psychological and behavioral characteristics because those behavior, those characteristics are also genetic. So a golden retriever is different than a Maltese. And that is not because of how they're trained, it's because of the individual differences of genetics in that species. Those brains are substantially different. You do not train a person to be Einstein. Uh, there's no possible way to do it. So all the baby Einstein moguls in the world are not gonna make that kid a genius. It just cannot happen. Genius is in there. So the individual differences of personality are overwhelmingly genetic, and this is a proven fact of modern scientific psychology, and yet, okay, and yet, if you talk to a typical psychologist or the person who wrote that book, 
they are still mired in essentially a 19th century or early 20th century view of a man who's been dead for decades, okay, whose thinking still casts a pall over the clinical field uh, because the, the, the scientific uh, view of psychology is not well publicized and it's not out there in the popular press uh, particularly. And so, the, uh, so this is why we get people believing that something happened early in life that's causing them to be in the pleasure trap and the ego trap later in life. And I'm telling you, it's not true. And, uh, and, of course, we have staggering evidence to this effect. So whatever evidence that they're reporting, uh, it's in ignorance of the evidence that contradicts it. And so this is, uh, I'm not going to say that things that have happened bad to people in their history don't have any impact on their lives at all. I'm not going to say that. But why it would specifically translate into eating behavior is bizarre. Okay. If I have a guy that's having trouble shooting his free throws on my basketball team, and he's struggling with this, what I do is I check his fundamentals. I put him on videotape and I see what he's doing. And we go in and we check what he's doing wrong that's giving rise to the mistakes that we're seeing. What I don't do is I don't analyze his childhood dynamics with his mother. Okay? That is not going to help me improve his free throw shooting. This behavior is not related to your childhood issues. Okay? There are other issues in your life that could be, but not this. This is an independent, automated, gene-driven decision-making system just like breathing. And the fact that people are doing it in a self-destructive way is because of the artificial foods in the environment that are here. Okay? That is what it is. And they have an addictive property as well as in the expectations on some people's part that they should be able to beat this easily. Now, uh, the problem is the pleasure trap is very difficult in its own right, and the ego trap makes it especially problematic and subject to repetitive failure. This is the reason. It is very emotional. Uh, people feel very defeated, very upset, demoralized. Their internal audience is sending them very negative self-esteem signals as it's frustrated with their lack of effort and their self-sabotage. These things are not emanating from deep psychological problems that came from childhood issues. That's not where they're coming from. They are emotional, they are difficult, they are problematic, and they are tenacious. Okay? Uh, but the solution will not be found in some kind of resolution of some childhood fixation on some bad memory. No, you are looking in the wrong place. Uh, we need to look and instead at the fundamentals of the problem that we're facing. Yeah, I, I used to believe that until I had a session with you and I was telling you about my dad. My dad was kicked in the head by a horse before I was born, and he actually had a gash. He actually had brain damage, so he became yeah. psychotic and violent. So he used yeah. to torture my dog in front of me and beat the crap out of my brothers and my mom, which was not pleasant for a four- and five-year-old. And I used to tell you that it was very upsetting, and I yeah. used to go eat these cookies. And you said to me, well, is that the only time you ate the cookies? And I never thought about it. It's like, no, I ate the cookies all the time because I realize now that with the environment being the number one predictor of, the, of our success, I lived in a pleasure trap environment with cabinets of cookies and chips and all kinds of uh, sweetened cereal. And you really broke me of believing this when you said that there were plenty of happy people in line at Cinnabon and plenty yes. of depressed people eating fruit. And, and so... Unfortunately, my book was already written, and I do still think some of this thinking is in there, and it is what it is. Uh, so, you know, yeah. it, it's going to be difficult, I think, to convince people. I think they hold on to this. And maybe it's what you talk about, like, it kind of excuse me. I'm not, and again, I, I, I have to be so careful because I'm trying okay. to help people. I'm not yeah. saying that, that they're using it as an excuse, but what you said earlier is that sometimes they'll do these things like, well, my dog died, so I had to eat crap. As, right. as an excuse because they can't get out of the either trap or both. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think that there is a, I think there's definitely an unconscious um, uh, ego protective process that is looking for a reason because the individual is mystified as to why it is that they can't manage to summon this self-discipline. It appears to be easy. The the cost of having the problem is so high 
they recognize that cost is, is huge in their environment for their self-esteem, their interaction with, with other people, how other people find them. Um, they would dearly love to be have this problem behind them. The fact that they sabotage themselves through the pleasure trap and also through it through a careening self-destructive process called the ego trap, where they kick over the table. The, the, those that these failures are mysterious, and they are very emotional. And uh, as a result, the, the the price is high for this mess. And the individual somewhere deep in them sort of knows it's not their fault. Okay, they're a fine human. They are. They do so many things so well. They're ethical. They're smart. They're hardworking. They're they're ter- they could be fabulous people. And they they're, often are. They often are very kind, uh, loving, uh, funny, great people. But they got this one monkey on their back, and they can't they get it off. And the thing is, is that of course, if they go anywhere else but to me for help, they're very likely to have people say, "Well, this isn't really your fault." Mm-hmm. You've been damaged by somebody else. It's their fault. Yeah. So we're going to blame somebody else, something in the past, and we're going to go talk about that, rather than look, watching your free throwing. Mm-hmm. Basically saying, it's hard to be an 80% foul shooter. It's really hard. You're going to have to get to the gym. You're going to have to get a good night's sleep beforehand. You're going to go to the yoga person and get stretched out. Then we're going to look at some film. Then we're going to do a bunch of repetitive motions to try to get it straight. You know, you're you're a seven foot two magnificent athlete. We want you to be our starting center, but you can only shoot forty percent from the free throw line, and you're killing us. Okay, so we're going to pay you fifteen million dollars a year if you can get this free throwing done. And what do they do with these people? They don't analyze their childhood for why it is that they're doing that poor job. They get the very finest coaching to pay attention to the factors that we know are involved. Uh, rats, folks, and bees, and any animal where it's ever been tested falls right into the pleasure trap. They do. Every animal that's ever been tested will fall right into this mess, and they will be incredibly frustrated when you come out of it. It turns out that if you will give rats unlimited access to human chow, pizza, chocolate, etc., Coca-Cola, If you do that and you let them eat that for, say, 30 days, what's going to happen when you put normal rat chow in front of them is fascinating. The average rat will go on strike and not eat anything for 14 days. They will give the experimenters the finger, okay, the middle (laughs) paw on their hand. No, I'm not eating this. I can't stand it. I would rather starve. Yes. That is the experimental evidence from experimental psychology. This was conducted, I think, at the University of Pennsylvania, your alma mater. So we know it's really good, right out of the Ivy League, okay? The point is, is that we can see these processes taking place, and we can understand them at the level of neuroscience. We do not have to reach back into ancient history of unrelated behavior that's not related to feeding and come up with some convoluted answer of why you're damaged goods and you can't face this problem and it's not your fault. This is a horrendous trap to put on people. It feels kind. It feels like a nice excuse. It feels like we get to go play over here in the sand and not pay attention to the problem over here because it's not your fault. But none of it's your fault. And unfortunately, if you're going to be a better free thrower, we're going to have to look at the film and we're going to have to do the fundamentals and we're going to have to train and we're going to have to do the very damn best we can. And we're not going to send you to the shrink to talk about your psychoavailable problems. That we know is not going to help because that's not the cause. Right. So that's, that's the issue here. And so, yeah, that's why, you know, I have no interest in arguing with all the people that think that this had to do with, like, for the rest of my life, the most of the psychological world is going to believe yeah. that this all has to do with early childhood, this or that. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to roll my eyeballs and just say, sorry, you're looking in the wrong place. And in Las Vegas, I will I will present this, what I presented here, plus very important additional evidence. I know. Oh, you guys have to come because I know what it is. And I 
didn't want to interview him for this no. just now. Uh, you know, you, you, you remind me of Dr. Semmelweis, the guy that was ostracized by his colleagues because he told physicians they have to wash their hands, and that's why so many mothers were dying in childbirth. I, I think you're just a little bit ahead of your time. And to, to corroborate what you said is regardless of the amount of trauma abuse a person has had in the past or the amount of stress that they're having now, for some reason, when they go to this magical vortex known as Santa Rosa and attend either the McDougal program or go to the True North Health Center, they seem to be able to lose weight. It's like magical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. We, we see that magically the, the free throw shooting becomes better. So their magical. past hasn't changed and their current Not situations changed. hasn't changed, but what has changed is their environment, which is why we are so sticklers. Dr. Lyle, do you have time for one more question? And if you can't answer it completely, we can talk about it in Vegas or one more interview because we've got to almost everything on the list. So I had a, a gentleman come to my class who was sent by his physician because he was in stage four uh, kidney failure. So he was this close to dialysis, meaning he was already diabetic and on insulin and many medications, and he was morbidly obese probably 150 pounds overweight. And he, he didn't come to Ultimate Weight Loss. He came to just this, this cooking class I do that is the way that I eat, SOS-free diet, whole, you know, very low in fat, just delicious recipes, though. And so as I'm doing the class, for example, I'm cooking my food in a pressure cooker, and he says, oh, well, that's not good. You're going to, you know, lose nutrients, even though I have actual research that says it's one of the most best ways to retain nutrients. I put the, all the food in whole, like the onion. He goes, oh, you have to cut that onion because you won't benefit from all the properties if the onion is put in whole. I'm making a low-fat salad dressing. He goes, oh, if you don't put nuts and seeds in, you won't absorb the, macronutri uh, the micronutrients in, in the greens that we're eating. Um, I'm trying to, he, it's like, um, I was using an air fryer to show how to make delicious French fries without oil or salt. He goes, oh, well, you're going to get acrylamides and, and, that, and that's not good. And I mean, I, everything I had, I'm trying to think there were more things he, he said, oh, well, we shouldn't be eating rice. There's arsenic. And so everything I had, he, it, obviously he was highly intelligent. And because I was in a class situation, if he had come to me in a, as a private client, I would said to him, hey, go, go, look, you're on death's door. You're about to go on dialysis. You're 150 pounds over and you're really worried about how I'm cutting the onion or that we're not having nuts. So my question is just broader because why do people tend to major in minor things? Because you say in the pleasure trap that it's really not these deficiencies that are causing the problems, but but it drives me crazy. Well, with social media and Dr. X says, and people are focusing, you know, Dr. McDougal, I believe, calls it a distraction, like even GMOs. People, it, it, and I can understand if you're Alan Goldhammer, who has eaten perfectly for 40 years to really care about this minutia, but it drives me crazy because I can't do my work and make the food taste delicious when people are, they're literally, you know, seeing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. So I, maybe this is an evolutionary thing that people just like to focus on these things instead of the big picture. You know, I think you're, I think what you're looking at is your, um, you're, you're looking at a, a human fascination with deficiency. So the, uh, I think that, that ever since the discovery of vitamins, you know, the last 150 years, mm -hmm. people have been extremely, uh, and because also culturally, I believe, that when they discovered the connection between vitamin C and scurvy, for example, mm -hmm. this is a very, very big watershed discovery for human beings. And so suddenly now the concept of a vitamin, which means it's an essential nutrient, um, that, that now, you know, the race was on for discovering vitamins. Uh, I don't know how many of them there are. There are not very many of them. The, uh, but, so, but human beings, uh, it, they picked up on it. And their, their little eyebrows went up and they said, whoa, we, we have to make sure we're not deficient. Uh, similarly, they're actually similarly somewhat worried about infectious disease. They're worried about germs, too. So germs they're worried about deficiencies they're worried about. They're not worried about macronutrient excess. That they're not worried about. <laughs> and that, our ancestors never had a problem with macronutrient excess. Our ancestors did have a problem with infectious diseases. So when they learned of the cause of infectious diseases here in the last 150 years, that caught the world's attention. 
And the race was on to try to figure out what on earth is going on and why are 20 million people dying of the flu and what is this thing and et cetera. So people are, are interested essentially in microbiology uh, for both the concepts of, of deficiency and, and infectious disease. After that, they really don't care that much about macronutrients. And so your guy is a, your guy there is, is a fascinating, you know, he's a caricature of human nature, which is, you know, essentially the, the overweight man or woman, 50 pounds overweight, worried about whether or not they're getting enough, you know, uh, B12 because uh, they're not eating salmon. And they're worried about that. It's like, yeah, you should be worried about that, but you should be worried about that about a fiftieth as much as you are worried about it. And I think that you know your your guy is actually an extraordinary example of that of that uh, myopia, and that we have to live with it. And we that's why a chapter in the Pleasure Trap is called "Looking for Help in All the Wrong Places." Uh, it was it was that actually came out of a conversation with my father who was uh, di essentially dying of congestive heart failure, mm. telling me that he was going to eat salmon because it had a lot of good omega-3s in it. <laughs> uh. And I, I actually hung up the phone that morning so frustrated. I was in Oakland. I can remember where I was. And I was in, in Oakland, and my dad was in San Diego. And we had this conversation. He was in deep trouble. And... I tried to convince him, and I hung up the phone, and I said, this is crazy. I cannot believe that he's focused on that deficiency when his problem is excess. And I sat down and wrote uh, what would become that chapter. It started out as an article for Health Science Magazine and uh, called Looking for Help in All the Wrong Places. It then became a chapter in The Pleasure Trap, and it's a key a insight into the problems that we face in this arena when people start to get interested their interest starts with deficiencies, and uh, only only once they can park that and set that aside, do they graduate to a more a balanced and more holistic view of what it is that we're talking about. Right. Well, I learned that from you. Again, everything I know, you know, I feel like writing everything I know I learned from Dr. Lau because when I saw you as a patient for the first time in almost seven years ago, you know, I was eating my nuts every day, one ounce, weighed and measured because we have to have our omega threes and. I was 50 pounds overweight, and the minute I stopped eating them, I wasn't. And, you know, so what can you say? Learning process. Yeah, absolutely. Well, gosh, it has just been amazing talking to you. I could talk to you forever. And you guys can talk to Dr. Lyle, too. There's many ways. You can come to the Ultimate Weight Loss Live Conference Labor Day weekend in September and ask him questions. You can call in his podcast, his like a radio show, Wednesday night, 8.30 p.m. Pacific Time to 9.30 p.m. Pacific Time. It's on iTunes and Blog Talk Radio. It's called Beating Your Genes, G-E-N-E-S. It's fabulous. There's 73 archived episodes that will just blow you away you can and should read this book we read it once a year and uh it's just it really is an amazing book and i can't recommend it highly enough you can go to his website esteemdynamics.org there's so many free audios and videos you can watch you can even book a private session with them how cool is that that when your favorite author is actually available to talk to you so whether you need to get out of the ego trap or the pleasure trap or stay out or both Talk to Dr. Lyle because he's awesome. So thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. You are just That's such fun. a, it's, I just feel like when I talk to you, I get smarter. It's the weirdest thing, but it's just, it's just, it's amazing. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ and I make healthy taste delicious.